Mankind has always been trying to get to the bottom of the nature of things around us. And while there were times when people used to struggle to define the laws of classical physics, scientists of the 21st century are busy solving comparatively more sophisticated and challenging tasks. Thanks to the joint efforts of scientists of all times, there is an impressive list of scientific discoveries to mankind's credit. And now, the acquired knowledge allows us to take a peek at the most mysterious corners of the universe. Today, I invite you on a tour around our closest galaxies. But before reaching those, we will stop at the dwarf planet Makumaki and the trans-Neptunian object Sedna, talk about the weirdest objects ever to have approached our Earth, venture to the most horrifying exoplanets and fly by the star known as WR-102. A great trip is about to begin. Let's get started. Cosmo. First in outer space. It was Pluto that was the first astronomical body discovered beyond Neptune's orbit. It happened over 90 years ago back in 1930. Unfortunately, the technologies of the day were not advanced enough to be able to detect dim objects at large distances. That is why it took another 47 years before another discovery of a celestial object in that area of space had been made. In 1978, Charon was discovered, and the first asteroid beyond Pluto's orbit, Albion, was detected in 1992. The 1990s proved to be fruitful in terms of discovering a string of trans-Neptunian celestial bodies. But at the beginning of the 21st century, there was a positive boom in exploring remote parts of the solar system. That is when the prominent team of researchers Michael Brown, David Rabinowitz and Chadwick Trujillo pinpointed the most well-known space objects beyond Neptune's orbit. Among these, one designated 2005 FY9 can be singled out. Later on, it was to be renamed into Maki Maki. This exoplanet was first seen in images taken on the 31st of March 2005. And four months later, on the 29th of July, information about the newly discovered celestial object was made available to the general public after the official statement from the research group. When discovered, the planetoid was just slightly dimmer than Pluto. As for its location, at the time it was much higher than the ecliptic plane in the region of the constellation Coma Berenices. Thanks to archive images, Makimaki has been thoroughly studied by now. The planetoid's eccentricity isn't big, at just 0.162. The angle between the planetoid's orbit and the ecliptic plane is 29 degrees, which is why this object, bright and large as it is, hadn't been noticed before. When exploring those parts of our system, the first researchers had focused on the ecliptic plane, as they assumed that the chances of discovering new celestial bodies there were higher. At the time, however, the planetoid was located in the upper part of its orbit, which is why the researchers couldn't see it. Makimaki completes a full orbit around the system's center every 306 years. It is currently 52.5 astronomical units away from the Sun. The planetoid is going to reach its aphelion in the year 2033, with a distance to the Sun 52.82 astronomical units. Having receded from the parent star and reached its furthest point from it, Makimaki will start approaching it. The planetoid is estimated to reach its perihelion in the year 2187, with the distance separating it from the Sun being 38 astronomical units at that point. On the planetoid's closest approach to the system's center, its luminosity will be almost the same as that of Pluto, which will enable scientists to collect more accurate data about it. In terms of its orbit's parameters, the dwarf planet falls into the category of the so-called classical objects of the Kuiper Belt, or QB1. Unlike Plutinos, which are in orbital resonance with Neptune, QB1s lie quite far from this icy giant. That is why the gravitational influence exerted by Neptune over them is quite negligible. 
On the 23rd of April 2011, Makimaki's disk was passing in front of a dim star in the constellation Coma Berenices. Thanks to this eclipse, it was possible to estimate the planetoid's size rather accurately. Its equatorial diameter measures one and a half thousand kilometers. Its polar diameter, on the other hand, turned out to be 1,430 kilometers, which is around 62% that of Pluto. This earns Makimaki the status of the fourth largest transneptunian object, coming after Pluto, Eris, and Haumea. However, it may still be beaten by Gong Gong, whose parameters still haven't been estimated with a satisfying degree of accuracy. Makimaki's exact mass still remains to be found out. The planetoid's average density is estimated at approximately 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter, which is slightly lower than that of Pluto. This information allows us to gauge the dwarf planet's mass at roughly 3 times 10 to the power of 21 kilograms. Incidentally, it is 4% that of the Moon. Makimaki's rotation period is around 22 and a half hours, which is quite a lot for a dwarf planet. It is known that the planetoid faces the Earth with its equator, although the tilt of its axis with respect to the orbital plane hasn't been estimated yet. Makimaki is admittedly a rather bright object. The average ratio of its actual brightness equals around 0.8. First spectral analyses revealed that the planetoid's surface is not homogeneous. Most of it shows a high brightness ratio reaching 90%. Still, up to 7% of the dwarf planet's surface is dotted with dark spots absorbing up to 98% of the light shed on it. These patches are thought to be areas of surface made up of rocks that are peculiar to the planetoid. Strangely enough, Later observations carried out using the Galileo National Telescope showed Makimaki's surface as rather homogeneous. The dark spots reportedly seen on it may have been errors of observation or reflections of an unknown satellite that happened to be passing over the dwarf planet's surface. That is why further observations are needed to settle the question. Observations and spectral analysis revealed that Makimaki's surface is almost as bright as that of Pluto. It consists for the most part of methane, ethane and a very small amount of nitrogen. Continuous exposure to powerful ultraviolet rays is thought to have produced tholins, complex hydrocarbon polymers containing nitrogen. It is tholins that give methane snow on the surfaces of transneptunian objects a typical reddish hue. Makimaki's surface temperature is currently estimated at around 29 Kelvin or 244 degrees Celsius below zero. When Makimaki is in its perihelion, the temperature slightly rises to around 34 Kelvin or 239 degrees Celsius below zero. As the melting point of nitrogen and methane is much higher, it is logical to assume that the planetoid must be covered with reddish snow made up of methane mixed with ethane, nitrogen and tholins. Interestingly, observations and estimates show that methane on Makimaki's surface is crystallized and appears as rather large grains around 1 cm in size. As for ethane, it looks like grains measuring around 1 mm in diameter and filling smaller crevices and holes on the planetoid. It goes without saying that in such low temperatures, Makimaki's atmosphere is bound to be extremely rarefied. The density of gases just above the planetoid's surface is approximately 1 billion times as low as that on our Earth. The eternal ice the surface is encased in cannot melt even on the planetoid's closest approach to the Sun. Besides, most of the solar energy reaching the dwarf planet rebounds back into space on account of the object's high albedo. For a long time, it was thought that Makimaki didn't have any satellites. However, in 2015, a group of American researchers did detect a celestial body orbiting the planetoid. That's when its main parameters were gauged. The object hasn't been given a name yet, and for now is officially catalogued as S-2015. Still, the satellite was informally nicknamed MK2. As usual, a quick overview of the basic parameters. To begin with, 
MK2 is a small and dark celestial body that reflects around 7% of all light shed on it. Its diameter may measure anything from 90 to 200 km and the radius of its orbit cannot be less than 21,000 km. As for its orbital period, it is around 12 Earth days. The inner makeup of MK2 is thought to be identical to that of Makimaki. However, sun rays would have vaporized the layers of methane snow that used to cover its surface. Besides, with almost no gravitation forces exerted by the satellite to speak of, the gas's molecules would have floated away into space. It is admittedly an extremely slow process that takes billions of years to complete. As Makimaki's rotation period is anomalously long, it gives grounds to assume that there is at least one more large satellite orbiting it, but it still remains to be discovered. Makimaki is currently located almost at the furthest point of its orbit, which makes it difficult to investigate it. However, sending out an interplanetary space probe to explore it is hardly sensible at this point. Estimates show that it will take the spacecraft around 16 years to reach the planetoid, even taking into account a gravity boost maneuver near Jupiter. Just in 150 years, mere seconds in astronomical terms, Makimaki will be closer to us than Pluto. Even though it will take a while, sooner or later it will certainly reveal its secrets to us. In the late 20th century, there was a major breakthrough in studying remote corners of our solar system. 3,555 celestial objects have been discovered beyond Neptune's orbit since the 1990s. Most of them are not very large bodies, made up of water ice and frozen gases like methane and nitrogen. Transneptunian objects form conventional areas around the Sun, like the Kuiper Belt, the scattered disk and supposedly the Oort cloud. The Kuiper Belt encompasses the solar system as a large ring at distances from 30 to 55 astronomical units from the center. It resembles the asteroid belt, only it is 20 times as wide and up to 200 times as massive. The Kuiper Belt consists mainly of debris remaining after the formation of the solar system, although it does contain rather large objects as well, like Pluto, Charon, Haumea, Makimaki and other planetoids. The borders of the scattered disk are more blurred. It consists of objects whose perihelion is over 35 astronomical units and whose orbits are elongated or lie closely to the ecliptic plane. Most of these objects are not very large and are quite gravitationally unstable. Most of the scattered disk's objects' orbits are posited to have been predefined by Neptune, with the latter having expelled them from the inner layers of the solar system, acting as some kind of a gravitational cannon. The largest space object in this area in space is the planetoid Eris. There is one more object worthy of our attention. It's a small planetoid called Sedna. That's what we'll talk about today. This dwarf planet was discovered on the 14th of November 2003 by American astronomers Michael Brown, Chadwick Trujillo and David Rabinovitz. At the time of discovery, it was thought to be the second largest object of the kind, beaten only by Pluto. However, very soon it found itself in the fifth place among all known transneptunian objects coming after Eris, Haumea and Makemake. As revealed by calculations of Sedna's orbit around the Sun, its trajectory is extremely elongated. Its perihelion is 76 astronomical units, which is two and a half times the radius of Neptune's average orbit. Sedna's aphelion is 942 astronomical units away from the Sun. Thus, the planetoid must be one of the remotest and apparently the coldest objects in our system detected so far. That is actually what has earned it its name. One of its discoverers, Michael Brown, has dubbed it after an Inuit goddess of sea animals. Sedna completes a full orbit around the center of the solar system within approximately 11,500 years. When discovered, it was 89.6 astronomical units away from the Sun. 
This is approximately twice the distance to Pluto. Sedney is now on its way to meet the Sun. It is expected to reach its perihelion around the year 2076. However, the Sun will not be visible as a disk from the dwarf planet's surface even from the closest point of its orbit. When watched from Sedna, our Sun will look like a very bright star, with a luminosity much higher than that of the Moon in our sky. Sedna's diameter is about a thousand kilometers. It is only 40% that of Pluto and slightly smaller than Charon. Unfortunately, there are no moons around Sedna, that is why it is hardly possible to gauge its mass with a high degree of accuracy. As it is, it is estimated at 1 to 10% that of our moon. In plain exact numbers, it could be anything from 8.3 times 10 to the power of 20 kilograms to 7 times 10 to the power of 21 kilograms. Only a special expedition to the dwarf planet's environs would yield much more precise data. Sedna's rotation period is about 10 hours, with the rotation axis tilting to the orbital plane at almost 12 degrees. The planetoid's bright red surface reflects around 32% of the light shed on it. Spectral analysis shows that the dwarf planet's outer layers are mostly made up of water ice and frozen gases methane, ethane and nitrogen. Prolonged ultraviolet radiation treatments of the hydrocarbon sludge on the surface produced tholins, organic polymers containing nitrogen. It is these substances that give the planetoid surface its bright color. Sedna will be comparatively close to the Sun for about 200 years. In this time, its surface temperature will rise to 35.6 Kelvin or 237.6 degrees Celsius below zero. This will make some of the gases shrouding the planetoid evaporate, which in its turn will greatly rarefy the atmosphere. However, the most optimistic estimates show that its density will be 70,000 times less than that of the Earth at the very least. When the planetoid hits the escape trajectory from the Sun, its temperature will rather dramatically fall to a few degrees above absolute zero. It is thought that unlike on Triton, Pluto and Deris, there are no methane snow precipitations on Sedna on account of its low temperatures. Even though Sedna was discovered almost 30 years ago, scientists still don't have a unanimous opinion about it. One of the things on which they don't agree with each other is where it belongs, that is, whether it is part of the scattered disk or the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is a hypothetical area in the solar system lying beyond the scattered disk and stretching for up to 100,000 astronomical units away from the Sun. Its borders are rather blurred. This part of the solar system looks like a spherical cloud made up of a great number of comet nuclei. It is from here that comets with enormous orbital periods of tens of thousands of years take off, as it were. The Hill Sphere, or the Sun's gravitational sphere of influence, is considered the cloud's outer boundary. The sphere's radius is about one light year. Sedna's orbit is so elongated that as it travels in the solar system, it traverses the entire area of the scattered disk and approaches the inner boundary of the Oort cloud. Some scientists believe that the object is too far from the main planets in the solar system, and so their gravitational pull is negligible. Besides, Sedna was estimated never to have come close enough to Neptune to have had its orbit in any way affected. These clues lead us to believe that Sedna is much closer to the Oort cloud objects even though most of its orbit finds itself within the scattered disk. As Sedna is remote and barely studied, there are theories awaiting further confirmation. For example, modeling the process of radioactive decay suggests the possibility of there being a liquid ocean in the planetoid's interior. Calculations of the trajectories of several transneptunian objects with elongated orbits, including Sedna, give grounds to believing that there is an undiscovered massive object located beyond the boundaries of the Kuiper Belt. Data collection is underway, and its results will either confirm or repudiate these assumptions. Even though Sedna is listed in NASA's program of the Solar System Exploration, 
No spacecraft is planned to be sent to it in the nearest decades. Perhaps it will be paid due scientific attention when the distance between the dwarf planet and the Earth is considerably smaller. Sedna may well be a really remote celestial object, but there are some even further than that out there in the solar system. For example, the object 2018 AG37, also known as Far Far Out, was spotted 132 astronomical units away from the Sun. It is the remotest object in the solar system that can be observed directly. Interestingly, while following their orbits, some celestial objects already known to us may recede from the Sun much further. For example, the aphelion of the comet C1992J1, spotted by David Rabinovitz in 1992, is 3,650 astronomical units. This means that it will take 78,000 years to complete a full orbit. There are many comets of this kind with elongated orbits and a mind-boggling orbital period that are still waiting to be discovered. Who knows? One of you might be able to do that at some point. Generally speaking, celestial bodies with such parameters fall into the category of interstellar objects. Interestingly, they're usually not gravitationally dependent on any star and are quite free to choose their own course. In theory, such space wanderers may come from asteroid belts of other stellar systems and then, after they collide with a larger object, their orbits may change. This makes them break away from their native systems. The same mechanism of producing interstellar space objects is applicable to our system too. The greater number of bodies from the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt eventually end up in interstellar space. Bearing this in mind, it seems reasonable to assume that there is a much greater number of objects in our system that originally come from somewhere in deep space than thought earlier. For example, on rare occasions, interstellar interlopers may be captured by the gravitational pull of a larger celestial body. Then they may be influenced by the Sun's gravity that will lock them on a heliocentric orbit. The only closest planet able to perform this on account of its impressive mass is Jupiter. It is in the environs of this gas giant that a comet can be found, which is one of the most unusual short-period comets ever detected in the solar system. Spotted on the 12th of May 1986, the comet was dubbed 96P Magholtz-1. The object's peculiar characteristics are its most unique features. To start with, the comet's orbit is exceptionally elongated, which allows it to approach the Sun as close as 0.123 astronomical units. Just to compare, this is two and a half times smaller than Mercury's perihelion. Its chemical composition is another of its unusual characteristics. It contains 72 times less cyanogen than any regular comet. These properties give astronomers grounds to suppose that Macholtz 1 was born far away from the boundaries of our system. Having been captured by Jupiter's gravity, it was indeed brought into a heliocentric orbit. Nevertheless, Macholtz 1 remains a hypothetical interstellar interloper whose origins are in essence quite untraceable today. Meanwhile, there are thousands of comets and asteroids already known to us, and among them there are some astronomical bodies that have arrived to our system comparatively recently. One of these is the comet known as 2I Borisov. Whizzing through our system at 30 km per second, this object is gravitationally independent from the Sun. The comet 2I Borisov is likely to have set out on its long journey from the Cassiopeia constellation near the border with the Perseus constellation. There are several points in space that claim the title of the comet's parent stellar systems. Ross 573, GJ4384 and HD 34327. As for the comet's characteristics that have been found out so far, its diameter measures 20 km and its orbit is hyperbolic. At the same time, the comet's spectrum is very similar to that of most other comets in the solar system. 
the celestial object is consistently observed. Two consecutive flares were registered on 2i Borisov in early March 2020 by astronomers from the Ogil project team. The processes suggested by these telltale manifestations are indicative of an explosion in the comet's interior, with a large fragment ejected as a result. However, nothing is known about what happened to the newly formed chunk. Even in spite of the uniqueness of the comet 2i Borisov, it is quite logical that such like celestial objects do exist. Sooner or later, an object like that was supposed to pass through our system. But it is hardly possible to say so about another celestial body we'll be looking at. Namely, about the first interstellar asteroid ever detected, dubbed Oumuamua. The asteroid was detected on the 19th of October 2017 by the Canadian astronomer Robert Werrick. The object was 30 million kilometers away from the Earth at that time. At first, Oumuamua was mistaken for a comet, but later it was reclassified as another kind of celestial body, a hyperbolic asteroid. It is highly likely that the starting point for the object's travels was in the environs of the Vega star and then it set out towards our system, following a hyperbolic trajectory and moving at a speed of 26 km per second. Scientists cannot say how long Oumuamua may have been racing through interstellar space. And for all we know, the solar system may be the first planetary system the asteroid has visited after its ejection from the parent system. The object is posited to consist predominantly of rock, and its diameter is estimated at approximately 200 meters. Being cigar-shaped, the asteroid may rightfully be called one of the most elongated objects in the solar system. According to the astronomer David Jewett, it is its shape that mainly draws scientists' attention. The reason for that is that a celestial object with such peculiar looks must have some unique story of its origin, having formed either as a result of a destructive event or else artificially. For example, at some point of its existence, Oumuamua may have been a shard of a protoplanetary body, with the latter having approached its native star too close and ultimately having been torn apart by its tidal forces. Computer modeling of such events revealed that if there is a large celestial body within several hundred thousand kilometers from its star, it may really be destroyed under the influence of stellar tidal flows this makes it disintegrate into exceptionally elongated bits, whose kinetic energy allows them to leave their system. This event is thought to have happened approximately 45 million years ago. This spurred some scientists to put forward another hypothesis. They maintained that in theory this object might actually turn out to be a spaceship constructed by an alien race. To futurologists' deep regret, astronomers closed the case in 2019, proving once and for all that there is absolutely no evidence in support of the hypothesis that Oumuamua was created artificially. At the moment, the asteroid is on an escape trajectory from our solar system, heading towards the Pegasus constellation. The velocity at which it is racing away from the Sun has proved to be slightly higher than had been predicted by applying celestial mechanics laws. The value reached around 31.6 km per second on the 1st of June 2018. Hypothetically, it will be possible to send a mission to this asteroid. This would allow us to find out more about its properties. However, no existing spacecraft would be able to catch up with Oumuamua, as the speed at which it is streaking through space is too high. In theory, it is feasible to get close to the asteroid after a gravity boost maneuver performed near Jupiter and thanks to the Oberth effect, which is supposed to greatly boost the engine's acceleration. More advanced options for the purpose are considered as well. Among these, scientists suggest using a laser-pushed light sail based on the breakthrough Starshot technology. However, it should be noted that the main challenge that will have to be tackled in the course of the missions will be to reach the asteroid in as little time as possible, while at the same time to be able to collect valuable scientific data. If, on the other hand, the spacecraft accelerates too much, it will not go into Oumuamua's orbit and will simply whip past it and fly on. 
And so today, investigating the asteroid with the help of spacecraft remains just a theory. If a mission of this sort does get launched sometime, it is hard to imagine what secrets lurking in this celestial body may be revealed to us. Having negotiated millions of kilometers on their travels, objects like Oumuamua are bound to be sources of staggering amounts of valuable information. No one can tell what events they may bear traces of. In addition to that, interstellar interlopers may in theory turn out to be the carriers of varieties of matter which are unknown to us. If mankind is able to reach the surface of one of these objects, a mission like that might well find answers to many questions about these mysterious celestial travelers. Shortly before Halloween in 2020, NASA compiled a list of the most terrifying worlds. Among others, they included six exoplanets. Each of these objects' environments is not just extremely harsh for any living organism. Even finding oneself in their comparatively close proximity may prove to be fatal. The first object on the list is a black gas giant, designation TRES-2b. This celestial object orbits the star TRES-2, which is a yellow dwarf lying as far as 718 light-years away from us. Let's take a closer look at it. Due to some unique properties of the chemical composition of the surface of TRES-2b, the planet absorbs over 99% of all the light shed on it. The nature of these properties remains a mystery, and chances are there are some chemical reactions taking place on the surface that we have never registered on any similar object before. And it is these properties that make TRES-2b the darkest exoplanet on the astronomical map of today. This gas giant was discovered on the 21st of August 2006, with more details on its characteristics obtained several years later. The mass of TRES-2b is 1.2 Jupiter masses, and its radius measures 1.27 times that of Jupiter. The atmosphere is as scorching as 1000 degrees Celsius, which gives the exoplanet a faint red glow like that of embers. Still, in spite of its gloomy looks, TRES-2b doesn't really qualify to be called the most dangerous place in the universe. There are many more objects lurking in space that are more terrifying than that. Let's see some more inhospitable ones. Here is another exoplanet, designation 55 Cancri E. It lies in the system of a sun-like star, designation 55 Cancri A. This celestial object was discovered on the 30th of August 2004 by the Doppler spectroscopy method. Let's look at it in more detail. The planet's mass equals approximately 8 Earth masses, and its radius measures 1.875 that of the Earth. 55 Cancri E is tidally locked, and so it is always daytime on one side and nighttime on the other. That is why the side facing the host star is always heated up to a temperature reaching 2400 degrees Celsius, with the temperature on the night side 1300 degrees Celsius. These values are so high because the distance between the planet and its parent star is just 0.0183 astronomical units. Besides, volcanism on 55 Cancri E, which is thought likely to be there, causes dust clouds emissions. These clouds trap heat and effectively prevent it from escaping into space. The planet's orbital period is slightly under 18 hours. As for the atmospherical makeup, there is helium and hydrogen registered in it. There are also large amounts of carbon. Incidentally, this element is likely to form thick layers of graphite and diamonds in the planet's interior. 55 Cancri E isn't the only object in the planetary system of its host star. There are four other celestial objects orbiting it. The environments on these are by far more hospitable, which is the feature by which the 55 Cancri A system differs from the following object. It is dubbed Poltergeist, or PSR 1257 plus 12C. 
This is an exoplanet lying in a pulsar system. The celestial object is located just 0.36 astronomical units from the system's center. This shows that Poltergeist wouldn't have survived a supernova that must have taken place before the pulsar had been formed. Consequently, the exoplanet is likely to have formed after this tremendous event, with the material for it coming from the nebula left after the explosion. According to another hypothesis, the pulsar may have formed after the merging of two white dwarves. Unlike with a supernova, this process isn't always accompanied by a powerful blast. Still, as this is the first object of its kind we have discovered, science cannot give a definite answer as to its origins. The system with the celestial object lies 2,300 light-years from the Earth. Its mass is approximately four times that of our planet. As for its orbital period, it is around 66 days. Incidentally, the outstandingly powerful radiation emitted by the pulsar is enough to crumple any spaceship wanting to approach the mysterious exoplanet in its system. Even with all these properties taken into account, Poltergeist does not really qualify as the most dangerous exoplanet known to us. On approaching it, an astronomical body may simply get destroyed, but it would get positively vaporized in close proximity to the following object. The reason for this effect is the extremely high temperature on Kepler-70b, which is the hottest exoplanet known to us. The object orbits the subdwarf star Kepler-70. With a surface temperature higher than that on our Sun, it reaches 6,800 degrees Celsius. The object's mass equals 0.44 Earth masses, and its radius measures 0.76 that of the Earth. The celestial object's orbital period is 345 minutes. In other words, a day here is less than six hours long. Interestingly, the exoplanet regularly passes another object in the system, Kepler-70c, at a distance of 240,000 kilometers. To date, this is the closest that planets in space have been registered to pass each other. The extremely high temperature on Kepler-70b could be accounted for by the fact that this object may once have been part of its parent star. As for giving it the status of an exoplanet, it will take more evidence to confirm that it deserves to be given it. So this remains an open question. It should be mentioned that Kepler-70b is not the only celestial object we know of that interacts with its parent star so closely. Another object in similar conditions is the exoplanet known as WASP-12b. This celestial body lies 870 light-years away from our system. Its radius measures 1.93 times that of Jupiter, and its mass equals 1.46 Jupiter masses. WASP-12b is just 0.03 astronomical units away from its parent star. Due to this close proximity, the exoplanet has a temperature reaching as much as 2,200 degrees Celsius. The host star's extremely powerful gravitation slowly absorbs WASP-12b. Eventually, in approximately 10 million years' time, the exoplanet is expected to be destroyed completely. Bearing all this in mind, we will probably never delve any deeper into the nature of this exoplanet. It would appear that studying worlds of this kind cannot be high on scientists' list of priorities. However, some of these objects may happen to have some really unique features. Seemingly quite plain and ordinary, worlds like that may conceal many more dangers than would appear at first glance. When flying past the celestial body HD 189733b, for example, one might complacently think it a safe planet, as it resembles our Earth by its looks. But if one were to get as low as the level of its atmosphere, one would be exposed to some life-threatening dangers. For a start, the object's winds carry particles of silicate and develop velocities of 8,700 km per hour. Besides, the rains on this planet cause precipitations of molten glass. 
The reasons for such hazardous weather conditions are extremely high temperatures and the atmosphere's peculiar chemical composition. Speaking about the exoplanet's orbital period, it is approximately 2.5 days. And it is highly likely that the object is tidally locked to its parent star. As usual, a quick overview of its main characteristics. HD 189733b is a bright blue gas giant orbiting an orange dwarf in the constellation Volpecula. It lies just 63 light years away from our system. The object's diameter is 1.1 times that of Jupiter, and as for its mass, it is 113% that of Jupiter. Interestingly, the distance between HD 189733b and its star is 30 times less than the distance between the Earth and the Sun and equals approximately 5 million kilometers. Due to its close proximity to the parent star, it has a constant surface temperature of as high as around 930 degrees Celsius on the day side, with the temperature on the night side never dropping below 425 degrees Celsius. Immediately on being discovered, the celestial body became a subject of investigations. In 2007, thanks to data obtained by the Hubble telescope, scientists found out that HD 189733b has a foggy atmosphere. Interestingly, when the planet transits between the observer on the Earth and its star, its atmosphere assumes a reddish hue. This effect could possibly be caused by the haze in the atmosphere. According to preliminary estimates, it consists of particles of iron, silicates and aluminium oxide. Apart from that, the information beamed back by the Hubble telescope helped scientists establish that the planet's atmosphere contains water vapor, neutral oxygen and an organic methane compound. Additional investigations revealed the presence of carbon monoxide on the day side of the planet. What prompted most questions, however, was the results of investigations revealing traces of methane of an unusual variety in the planet's atmosphere. This chemical element was shown to be in a peculiar fluorescent state when it emits electromagnetic radiation in the infrared range. This state of the substance is indicative of some unknown activity in the atmosphere of the exoplanet, which still remains to be found out. This is quite a clear-cut example of a situation when investigating an object like an exoplanet with an exceptionally harsh environment may yield unexpected results about some processes taking place there that will be a valuable contribution to science. And as the process of studying these worlds continues, they will remain no other than horror planets to us, as well as a solid reminder that we are more than just lucky to be the dwellers of our Earth. Temperatures of any star's interiors are incredibly high. It is hardly surprising, as thermonuclear synthesis, that is the main energy source of all stars, can take place only in these extreme conditions. When two atoms of hydrogen merge, they produce an atom of helium and release an electron and several neutrinos. In addition, a great amount of energy is released during the process. Still, the hydrogen-helium synthesis isn't the only process that heats up stars. At higher temperatures, other elements may take part in chemical reactions as well, for example lithium, carbon or oxygen. In this case, cores of heavier elements are produced, such as sulfur, magnesium or phosphorus. Their charge is higher and they repel each other more robustly. Much more energy is needed to overcome this resistance. When a main sequence star depletes most of its hydrogen supply, it starts to expand and cool off. With time, it ends up as a red giant. It will continue to burn due to thermonuclear reactions of helium transforming into carbon and oxygen. The lighter the star, however, the less time it will continue to burn. Eventually becoming unstable, it sheds its outer layers and goes supernova. This leaves it a white dwarf, with no resources to fuel any thermonuclear reactions anymore. With all its energy sources depleted, it is forced to gradually cool off. Interestingly, when the mass of a star is higher than a certain value, 
heavy thermonuclear synthesis may become the star's main energy source even after all hydrogen has been used up. Such celestial objects are referred to as wolf rayette stars. This class of space objects was discovered back in 1867 by the French astronomers Charles Wolfe and George Rayette. The scientists' attention was caught by anomalously bright emission lines of heavy elements in these stars' spectra. As for the inner makeup of these unusual celestial objects, it was accounted for much later. Stars of this class are generally heavy. They have quite a meager supply of hydrogen and are in the final stages of their evolution. Wolf Rayad stars are extremely rare. To date, just a few hundred of them have been discovered in our galaxy. As for their overall count in the Milky Way, it is estimated that there can't be over 2,000 celestial objects of this class. Wolf Rayad stars are subdivided into three main sequences depending on the prevalent element in the spectrum. Nitrogen, carbon and oxygen sequences. Each of them, in its turn, is subdivided into several types. As for the hottest star in the studied universe, it falls into the category of the oxygen spectral sequence ones. The celestial body, which is now known as WR102, was discovered back in 1971. At first, it was mistaken for the optical counterpart of the X-ray source GX3 plus 1. However, further observations revealed that there were two completely different objects. According to data acquired thanks to spectral analysis, the discovered star had unusually bright oxygen lines in its radiation spectrum. Thus, in 1982, WR102 and four more bright stars became the first to form a new class. Spectral analysis showed that the star's surface temperature reaches over 210,000 Kelvin. This makes WR102 approximately 36 times as hot as our Sun. The luminosity of this scorching hot object is unbelievable. It is estimated at over 380,000 times that of the Sun. WR102 lies about 10,000 light-years away. The star is located in the part of the sky with the constellation Sagittarius. Incidentally, in spite of its exceptionally high luminosity, it can't be seen with the naked eye, as it is too far away from us. WR102 currently belongs to the extremely rare star class W02, containing great amounts of oxygen and almost no hydrogen it mainly relies on the merging of heavy cores of such elements as neon, carbon and oxygen as its sources of energy. To date, only nine objects of this class have been discovered, with four of them located in the Milky Way and the other five in other galaxies. There are two factors that make oxygen spectral sequence stars rare. Firstly, there are very few of Wolf Rayet stars around because only stars with a mass not less than 40 solar masses are potential candidates to become ones. Secondly, this class represents the final stage of evolution of stars of this type. The stage may last anything from 1000 to 10,000 years, which is mere seconds in astronomical terms. Being of comparatively modest dimensions, WR102 is notably quite a dense star with its radius measuring just 58% that of the Sun, its mass, on the other hand, is estimated at 15 to 18 solar masses. On its birth, it is thought to have been as heavy as 40 to 60 solar masses. Still, the high temperature and robust chemical reactions in the star's interior cause an exceptionally powerful stellar wind, whose particle's velocity is over 5,000 km per second. It takes WR102 just a few months to lose one Earth mass worth of material on account of its stellar wind. At this rate of particle emission, the star is going to lose one Sun mass worth of material in the course of 10,000 years. There are no planets orbiting WR102, but it is shrouded in a gas envelope not dense and exposed to powerful ultraviolet radiation and strong stellar wind, 
the envelope gets contracted and dionized, which sustains its elaborate structure of protuberances and arches all around the star. According to a proposed theory, the gas cloud around WR102 may probably be remnants of the former hydrogen outer layer of the star. Another theory maintains that the cloud came to be as a result of the particle flow emitted by the star. WR102 is not the only outstandingly blistering place in the universe. For example, WR142, WR30A and WR93B, as well as the central star in the Bug Nebula NGC 6302, are as hot as around 200,000 Kelvin. Some white dwarfs may have almost the same surface temperature. However, all these are no match to neutron stars. When neutron stars are born, their temperatures may reach a staggering 100 billion Kelvin. Active neutrino emissions cool them off comparatively rapidly. But either way, the surface temperature of any neutron star is never less than a few hundred thousand Kelvin. As for their cause, they must, admittedly, be hotter still. Having said that, it is highly improbable that the ultimate temperature record is ever going to be beaten. According to today's cosmological concepts, the temperature of the universe at the moment of the hypothetical Big Bang was approximately 1.4 times 10 to the power of 32 Kelvin. A fundamental physical constant, this value is referred to as the Planck temperature. Contemporary physics is not capable of defining a substance of a higher temperature, as physical laws are distorted beyond any recognition in such incredibly harsh conditions, quite beyond our imagination. Getting back to WR102, judging by the data we have on stellar evolution today, this star is in its autumn years now. As opposed to main sequence stars, wolf rayet stars do not expand in their final stages of life. Their substantial mass holds all the star's material together in a dense and hot ball. However, after losing a lot of its mass through stellar wind, the object will eventually get destabilized. If current estimates are accurate, WR102 appears to be ready to go supernova at any point in the next 1,500 years. Bearing in mind that the distance between the star and the Earth is 10,000 light-years, it is highly likely that the event has already taken place. A supernova would have been accompanied by an extra-powerful gamma-ray flare. Fortunately, our planet is too far away to suffer any pernicious effects of this dangerous emission. WR102 is comprised of rather heavy chemical elements and even iron. Its later evolution will force it to contract to a critical point. The great explosion bringing the star's life cycle to a close will unleash processes of robust proton and neutron capture. This way, still heavier elements form, including transuranium ones. Eventually, WR102 will be replaced by a neutron star, a celestial body unbelievably hot and dense. The former star's outer layers, disrupted by the explosion, will form a nebula. Slowly cooling off, it will give off heat to the space around it. Many billions of years later, this material will be able to form a new planetary system. This is the way the large-scale evolution of the universe occurs. Supernova events release amounts of new elements, enabling new planets, asteroids and comets to get born. These astronomical bodies form elaborate systems bound by gravity. The elements making them up mutually react to produce infinite diversity of chemical compounds. That is why the cognition of the universe is really and truly quite endless. The exact number of galaxies in the universe is not known for certain yet. It is supposedly well over several hundred billion. Galaxies may be of all sorts of different shapes. As for the main varieties, they include elliptical, spiral, lenticular and irregular galaxies. There are subcategories for these as well. The Milky Way, for example, is a barred spiral galaxy. 
Since any galaxy consists of a great number of stars, these objects' masses may reach incredible values. The mass of the dwarf galaxy Segway 2, for example, is just 550,000 times that of the Sun. As for the supergiant elliptical galaxy IC1101, it is 1,700 times heavier than the Milky Way. Together with its immediate neighbors, our galaxy comprises what is known as the local group. It includes over 50 galaxies, three of which are quite large in comparison to the others. These are the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy. The diameter of the local group measures approximately 10 million light-years and its mass is about 3 trillion times that of the Sun. Together with a few other galaxy clusters of more modest dimensions, the local group in its turn comprises the local sheet, a flat cloud with a diameter measuring approximately 23 million light-years. It is about 5 million light-years thick. The local sheet forms part of the Virgo supercluster, a vast element of the large-scale structure of the universe. The local group is conditionally divided into four parts. The first one is the subgroup of the Milky Way, comprised of our galaxy and its satellites, which may be either dwarf galaxies or star clusters. The Milky Way is the second largest galaxy in the cluster, According to today's estimates, it contains 200 to 400 billion stars, as well as from 25 to 100 billion brown dwarfs. Our galaxy has a spiral structure and appears to be a disk with a diameter measuring about 200,000 light-years. At the same time, its thickness is just around 1,000 light-years. Still, there is a bulge at the center of the disk with a diameter of around 27,000 light-years. A supermassive black hole with a mass of as much as 4.3 million times that of the Sun is supposedly concealed inside the bulge. A smaller black hole is said to be orbiting it, whose mass is anything from 1 to 10,000 times that of the Sun. It is posited that it is dark matter that accounts for most of the mass of the Milky Way, which is why it is impossible to estimate it at this point. According to the latest estimates, however, the mass of our galaxy is approximately 1.5 trillion times that of the Sun. Going slightly further from the Milky Way, we can observe its 31 satellites. These are mostly irregular-shaped dwarf galaxies. They get so twisted and bent in every which way on account of the gravitational influence of their massive neighbor. Our closest satellite is the dwarf galaxy CMA Dwarf, which can be found in the Canis Major constellation. It lies 25,000 light-years away from the Earth and 42,000 light-years from the center of our galaxy. Appearing like an elongated ellipsis, this dwarf galaxy contains supposedly around 1 billion stars, most of which are red giants. Due to the gravitational influence exerted by the Milky Way, the Canis Major galaxy has almost broken apart. Tidal forces had the following disrupting effect. The stars torn out from the galaxy came to form the so-called Monoceros Ring, an elaborate ring-shaped structure that traps around the Milky Way. Unfortunately, observation of CMA Dwarf is greatly thwarted by gas and dust clouds floating between the galaxy and our Earth. The largest satellite of the Milky Way and the fourth largest galaxy in the local group is the Large Magellanic Cloud. It is located as far as about 163,000 light-years, containing approximately 30 billion stars. It has a diameter of just seven times as little as that of our galaxy. At the same time, the cloud's mass is 300 times as little as that of the Milky Way. The explanation for such a stark contrast is this. The Large Magellanic Cloud does not happen to contain a supermassive black hole in the center. Besides, there are great amounts of dark matter in the Milky Way's galactic halo. The Large Magellanic Cloud is an SBM type, which is in between dwarf spiral and irregular galaxies. Even though the gravitational influence exerted over it by its massive neighbors has as well as erased almost all traces of its former spiral structure, the bar in the center remains to be clearly distinguishable. 
There are a few especially notable objects located in the Large Magellanic Cloud. For example, the star R136A1, lying 165,000 light years away, is the heaviest star ever detected. This blue supergiant's mass is 315 times that of the Sun, and its surface temperature is as scorching as over 40,000 Kelvin. The luminosity of R136A1 is 8.7 million times that of the Sun. The Large Magellanic Cloud is also home to one of the largest stars in the investigated parts of the universe. The diameter of the red giant WOHG64 is over one and a half thousand that of the Sun. This is just 25% less than the diameter of the largest supergiant ever detected, Stevenson 2-18. According to today's accepted concepts of stellar evolution, WOHG64 is currently in the final stage of its life and is expected to go supernova at any moment in the next several thousand years. When speaking about the Milky Way subgroup, of course we can't but mention the Virgo stellar stream. Occupying approximately 5% of the entire sky, it appears as an exceptionally scattered and dim flow of several hundred thousand stars on the outskirts of our galaxy. According to the overwhelming majority of scientists, the Virgo stellar stream is remnants of a dwarf spherical galaxy that has at some point almost completely been swallowed up by the Milky Way. Moving yet further, we will soon encounter the galaxy known as Andromeda, or the Andromeda Nebula. Together with its satellites, it forms part of the local group referred to as the Andromeda subgroup. The galaxy lies as far as around 800 kiloparsecs, or 2.5 million light-years, which earns it the status of our closest neighboring galaxy, which isn't a dwarf one. The diameter of the Andromeda Nebula measures approximately 220,000 light-years, which is slightly more than that of the Milky Way. With its star count of around a trillion, there are three to five times as many of them in it as there are in our galaxy. Interestingly, the masses of the two galaxies are more or less the same, at around one and a half trillion solar masses. The point is that the stars forming the Andromeda Nebula are on average older and lighter than those of the Milky Way. Andromeda is one of our closest neighbors. Appearing as an elongated light spot, it is also one of the few galaxies visible to the naked eye. Interestingly, its angular diameter is six times that of the Moon. The Andromeda Nebula is a spiral galaxy with two clearly defined arms. It is peculiar for its binary core. When we observe it through a telescope, we notice two clearly seen star clusters in the center of the galaxy, with a distance between them around five light years. According to one of proposed theories, at some point Andromeda swallowed up another galaxy, capturing its core. Another supposition has it that there is, after all, just one core, with some part of it obscured by a dust cloud. It is estimated that the overall mass of the central part of this galaxy is over 140 million solar masses. There are approximately 400 globular clusters in the Andromeda Nebula, which is about two to three times as many as there are in the Milky Way. This means that it probably swallowed up quite a few dwarf galaxies in the past, and the clusters it contains now are the remnants of their cores. Andromeda has around 30 satellites. The ones that stand out are dwarf spiral galaxies, designations M32 and M110. Some theories suggest that M32 rammed the Andromeda Nebula several billion years ago, leaving a gargantuan hole in its structure. This had a serious effect on M32 as well, with a substantial part of this galaxy becoming Andromeda's galactic halo. The Milky Way is estimated to collide with Andromeda in around 5 billion years' time. Today, it is still quite impossible to model this tremendous encounter and its consequences accurately, but it is bound to be a truly spectacular sight. The third large representative of the local group is the Triangulum Galaxy. It is twice as little as the Milky Way in size and has no confirmed satellites, but some dwarf galaxies of the local group may well be gravitationally bound to it. 
The Triangulum Galaxy is not likely to boast a supermassive black hole in its center. The diameter of the galaxy measures approximately 50,000 light years. The distance between Triangulum and the Milky Way is 2.7 to 3 million light years. The galaxy also contains the NGC 604 nebula, which is the largest known area in space where stars are actively born. The stellar nursery's diameter reaches 1,300 light years. Around 200 supergiants, with a total mass of 100,000 solar masses, are compactly grouped here. These stars are young and hot, with their powerful luminosity ionizing the gas the star cluster is enveloped in. This gives the gas a bright glow, which in its turn makes the nebula appear quite bright. Apart from the objects mentioned, there are other ones in the local group which don't fall into any of the mentioned subgroups. As a rule, these are remote dwarf galaxies and star clusters not tightly gravitationally bound to any of the three large galaxies. The galaxy IC10 can be singled out here. Lying approximately 2.2 million light-years away from the Sun, it is the only galaxy of the local group where stars are actively born. IC10 is shrouded in a hydrogen outer envelope, whose radius is much bigger than that of the galaxy itself. The stellar disk of IC10, meanwhile, rotates in the direction opposite to that of the outer envelope. With their mind-boggling dimensions of hundreds of thousands of light-years on end, even the largest galaxies remain tiny dots in the large-scale structure of the universe. The distances between them are staggeringly enormous, and even light takes millions of years to reach the closest of them. Nevertheless, we can still observe and study them. There are innumerable riddles lurking in the cosmos, and mankind keeps solving them one after another with unflagging zest, because every new discovery is just another step in our cognition of the universe. The places we've just seen are admittedly just a tiny portion of all the staggering diversity of the space objects known to us. If we ever manage to explore them all, the list will stretch across quite a number of documentaries. By taking small steps, we will slowly but surely bring the astronomical map of the areas of space comparatively close to us to a whole new level. And with every new celestial body added on this map, the picture of the universe is growing ever more appealing.